push record. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sue Grinnell. Uh, very excited to have Giselle with us today. So we're going to explore what graphic uh, facilitation, graphic recording is. And um, I actually met Giselle through Dana, and we've done a number of projects together. And what I found is having Giselle in the room while people are um, meeting and conversing and trying to figure things out really helps to enhance um, what it is that's being discussed and helps um, oftentimes to provide clarity um, in a way that sometimes words can't always do. Um, so I felt like with um, all of our discussions that we're having, I think, you know, you're all tasked with, um, you know, working with a variety of different groups and helping to make sense of what you're doing together, that this might be a tool. So another communication tool um, that could be of service to your work. And so our plan today is to, you know, have Giselle speak to what this work is, how it's been used, and actually demonstrate um, how it can be used live on the screen so you'll be able to see that. And then part of the offering is for those of you that are interested that you could work with Giselle to actually create um, some type of visual that will be of service to you, right? So, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Giselle. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Good morning, everyone. And um, apologies, I have two screens going, so I'll be trying to look at the cameras most as much as I can, but then I'll also be kind of shifting to the large screen I have over here. Uh, but just briefly, and I'm going to sort of share my screen as we go. Um, I'm a, a consultant who's based in San Francisco. Let me back up a little bit. And I, I work with lots of different kinds of organizations around process facilitation, communication, and the main methodology I use is, is graphic facilitation. So um, just so you know, what I'll be doing today is going through uh, what I see is, can you see my, the outcome slide here? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah. Um, I'll be introducing the graphic facilitation methodology. So kind of what it is, what it isn't, um, how it can be used in group settings so you have an idea of how it might work in your own um, organization. Um, we'll also talk about potential uses for it in group settings. I'll, I have lots of samples of work and case studies so you can get a sense of what other groups have done with it and the variety of uses. And then at the end, as Sue mentioned, we'll be doing a live demo of graphic recording so you can see what it looks like, what it feels like, uh, in in real time and when I work virtually I do it this way using you know through Webex or through zoom and some software I have here on my computer and when I'm face to face I often do it on big pieces of paper in in the room just so you have that okay so in terms of how we're gonna spend our time together um, Sue just opened our meeting and gave us a sense of what we'll be doing today I'm walking you through the agenda and the outcomes right now. And then I'll talk a bit about what is graphic facilitation. Uh, we'll do the case studies. There'll be some time for some Q&A also. So uh, just know that you will have time to ask questions that you have about what you've seen. We can go back to the case studies and uh, look more closely at anything you wanna look at. And then our uh, graphically recorded facilitated question will be, how might this be helpful in your own work? So an opportunity to think about how you might apply it, okay? And then we will close at 1130 um, for sure, if not a bit earlier, we'll see how it goes, okay? So um, I guess before that, I'm just interested to hear um, from folks on the phone, if you could just, um, and I guess we'll start, I, if you could just let me know, if you could think about on a scale from, you know, one to five, one being, I know, you know, absolutely nothing about graphic facilitation The you know, the uh, Sue's email sounded interesting to me. I just wanted to hear more to a five being, you know, I, I know a lot about this methodology. I'm really comfortable with it, you know, so on a scale between one to five, you know, one knowing nothing, five being kind of 
expert, so where you fall on the scale in terms of your knowledge and your familiarity with graphic facilitation. So if we could just quickly go through, um, and maybe we'll start with Patty. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Hi, um, I have very minimal experience with graphic facilitation, um, but I'm, I would like to learn more. <laughs> okay, so could you give a number, like between one to a five? Uh, probably two. Okay, great. And then uh, what about Sue Kincaid, what about you? Hi, I would say I'm about a two. Okay, perfect. And then Lori? Lori there? Maybe we'll circle back. Yeah. yeah uh, Martin, is Martin with us? Could you give a number? It, is it me, Maria? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have, I would say a one, no experience. Okay. Maria, I'm sorry. And then Dean and Sue, what about you? I, I would say I am, you know, pretty well versed in it. Um, someday I would hope to be able to be just like you, Giselle. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I want to be Giselle. When okay. I Did you um, have a number you would assign? Um, I would say I have a deep appreciation for it, but how to do it, I would say appreciation of like 10 and how to do it like a two. Okay. <laughs> what about you, Sue? I, I think the same thing. I really am in awe of it. So there's much this like what the value is. And, and I would say probably like, a, you know, a two to a three. Okay, great. So that's really helpful and um, just to give me a sense of what questions you might have or what you might be interested in as we go through. And mm -hmm. did we get Lori back? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Okay, sorry about that. I forgot I had put my mute button on. <laughs> um, yes, so I have seen this in action in a number of meetings that I've been at and so really seen how well it works. Um, but, um, but, and people have told me, oh, you should be doing that because oh, wow. I have kind of a graphic background at it. But, but it, when I, when they say that, I think, okay, well, I know nothing about it. But when I see it in action and working, I think this is the best thing ever. We need to use this more often. So I probably fall somewhere in a three in the overall understanding of it all. Great. All right. So we have a, like a few, like a one, we're kind of between ones and threes, maybe a little bit higher on an appreciation scale, but in terms of familiarity, maybe sort of between one and three, it sounds like. Right. All right. So hopefully what this also does, you know, for people who have experienced it before, will also give you a sense of, um, some, of the, some of the foundational thinking behind some of the methodology, and you can see um, some other uses in addition to what you may have seen before. So all right, so um, we're back to this slide, this what is graphic facilitation um, slide I have here. And one thing about this methodology is it's still relatively new in that it's probably about 30 years old in terms of practice. And sometimes people use different kinds of terminology um, to refer to different kinds of ways it can be used in group settings. So this is um, the way that I think about it and the way that I conceptualize graphic facilitation. And it really has these components. The one component, which may, maybe perhaps uh, folks are familiar with is, and certainly the work that I've done with Sue and Dana is uh, live graphic recording. So working with facilitators who are in the space, um, the graphic recorder is uh, sort of part of that team and also on the side listening and capturing the work of the group in real time using text and graphics. So that's live graphic recording. Um, also, there's sometimes the use of pre-designed templates. So for breakout groups, and I have examples of these that you'll see, uh, breakout groups are maybe processes that are repeated. Um, I've designed visual templates for uh, 
teachers at a school to do their professional development goals. So a process that they're going to do repeatedly or a process that you want to do with smaller groups where you want to get similar information back. Uh, a pre-designed template can be really helpful to guide that information. And then, of course, also best facilitative practices, right, that we all know around, you know, purpose, uh, the dynamics in the room, the, you know, the logistics side, making sure people are comfortable, the space is, um, is uh, sort of friendly and welcoming to folks, making sure that the agenda um, is, is designed thoughtfully, which is gets us to what bounds it all together, which is the process design. So how you make these uh, pieces real and uh, for the group in a way that um, gets people to where they want to go to their sort of predetermined outcomes. Okay, so those are the, um, often people uh, have experienced graphic recording and uh, perhaps um, the template piece is something that they've seen less often, but. I'd be interested to hear your feedback on that too. So just in terms of uh, some of the benefits of graphic facilitation, I think there's a sense that when you've been in the room and you've seen it, you're like, wow, this is, this is really engaging, but just a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about the why around that. So part of it is the engagement piece, right? So um, it's something that I have noticed that when I write down exactly what people say on a chart, there's a sense of group ownership and acknowledgement and a sense that people can contribute more fully when this methodology is used. Also working in this larger panoramic way, um, there are lots of patterns that get uncovered. People tend to be pretty fascinated by what will happen next, you know, and it's pretty straightforward and pretty simple, but there is this kind of unfolding drama about what will happen um, in the graphic recording. Um, this one here, if recording is faithful, people feel respected. If it's not accurate, they're drawn to make corrections and additions. So it's very easily um, validated. So often if I I am recording something, people will say, oh yeah, that's exactly what we mean. That's exactly what I, you know, uh, the way we should move forward. And if it's not, people will often correct me and say, actually, it's more like this, or could you change it? Or could you add this to it, right? Um, but what happens is um, people tend to create, co-create the same narrative and come to consensus about that narrative um, as they're working, right? So I don't know if folks have had the experience of being in a meeting and, you know, with a big group of people and you leave the meeting and someone says, you know, oh, you know, can you believe that this thing happened and that we talked about this? And the other person says, wait, I didn't experience that at all, but it's almost like people were in different meetings, even though you're in the same room. There's something really powerful about this methodology is that you're creating alignment through the methodology in real time. So it's also very efficient, okay? So, um, also a little bit more about the big picture thinking. Sometimes people ask, well, why do you work so big? Why is it so large? Um, and that is to really help encourage people seeing relationships and big picture patterns and themes. So often when I work with organizations, because you all are in the work from kind of top to bottom, people will say, we really need to create this, uh, a narrative, a cohesive narrative that contains just the essential elements of really what makes us different, what makes us special. And it's very hard to get to that place because there's a lot of complexity. So working graphically also helps people um, make choices about how to create a simple story, a simple powerful story out of all the complexity. So um, often that's done through use of metaphor. Uh, often that's done through use of using characters or you know people in your community. Um, and it's done through I would say using stories and metaphors that have meaning to the people that you are to, that have specific meaning to the people within your organization and in your communities. Right? So you see an example here um, that I've drawn, and this is, you know, I'll show you another one, but this is, for instance, a, uh, a history timeline, right? 
So by placing in real time all of these different uh, events that have happened throughout the, an organization, people start to understand the patterns that organizations have been through, some of the themes, what they might want to change, what they might want to retain. Okay. And then, finally, uh, the group memory piece. So there's something that creates a very sticky memory when there's the combination of a experience, a visual, um, and a conversation. So those things combined really create these very, very powerful memories that stay with people. So part of creating these large graphics is they have use and value in the space during the convening, but they're also very powerful ways to remind people of the work that took place after the fact. They can also be used as external communication tools, you know, so you can say, you can post a chart, you know, online and say, we, we had this convening last week, this is what happened, this is what we did. You can also use them as internal work tools or communication tools. So remember last week we met, we came to these three agreements, how are we doing on those? So you can also use it as an implementation tool as well. Um, I would also say that more recently I've had people uh, take charts that I've created and grab, you know, smaller images or uh, little drawn vignettes that I've that I've uh, created and pulled them out and use them in other kinds of communications. So putting them on emails or, for instance, I'm thinking about a group I worked with and they had um, these five categories and all of their work was going to fall within these five categories. So whenever they sent out an email reminder to the team, they pulled out an icon that I had created for that category and they just placed it right at the top. So people could see immediately, oh, this one is about learning and development. Oh, this one is about governance or whatever it happened to be. So it's also a way of organizing communication after the fact. Okay, so now I'm gonna walk you through uh, some samples. And if you have any questions about what you're looking at, I know it's kind of like a lot of information, <laughs> please let me know. And if um, I feel like we need to move on because of time, we will and we can circle back, but please feel like you can, you can pop in and ask me questions about anything you see. So if you remember those three circles, you know, that what is graphic facilitation, um, you know, Venn diagram, that I showed you earlier. One big circle was around graphic recording. So the live capture um, of work as it's happening. So this is an example of a graphic recording I did. You can see the speaker is John Boudreau, who's, um, who works at USC, um, a research director there who gave a, this is probably a, a 45 to one hour talk on uh, the future of HR. So, you can see what I did here is I started here on the left and he talked about these five forces of change and then talked about um, these other sort of three ways that, um, that, he that he saw the future of HR moving into, okay? So you see um, a combination of texts, graphics, illustrations. And also what I tried to do with this group, it was interesting and I don't know if you can tell from looking at this, but on the left, his, his, um, he, was, he started a little bit late. So I think he wanted to get a lot of information out there. So there was like a lot of really rapid stuff coming at me on the left-hand side. And then on the right, his thinking became a little bit more to me, a little easier to follow. So I was able to kind of fall into that pattern of the one, two, three there. So that is graphic recording. I think this is probably what some folks referred to before is what they'd seen previously. Um, here's another one. This is uh, something that I did for a consulting company um, down in Redwood City who brings in various clients. So this was, the title of this talk was Technical Governance for Modern Enterprise. So you see again, they've got these sort of five um, sort of major um, sort of areas that they were covering, speed, alignment, efficiency, 
preventing stagnation and embracing learning, and these other models. Okay, this so, is how, yeah. Um, it's Sue. I'm, I'm just um, wondering, and maybe we've talked about this before in the past, but just the colors and any significant in the colors, like oh, yeah. when you're doing it, like it just kind sure. of strikes me in that. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Um, I think what I tend to do <laughs> now is I tend to, to stay a little bit more spare, like spare on the color palette. I tend to choose the colors ahead of time and stick to those colors. Um, and I try to, or, to create hierarchies of what I'm hearing using color, size of font, um, placement, right? So when you look at it, there is a sense of, uh, okay, so when you look at this, you have a sense of if I scan this, what information do I get from it? Okay, so the title is Technical Governance for Modern Enterprise, right? And then if I sort of take another sort of click down, what are the main ideas there? So to me, it's the speed alignment, efficiency, preventing stagnation, embracing learning, or, or the, the five sort of uh, um, ways that this speaker recommended that, you know, enterprises think about technical governance in their organizations, right? So, and then within that, sort of what is the, um, what is the next layer down in terms of information that supports those ideas, right? Sometimes I work with folks and, um, you know, they're pretty specific about, okay, so these are our company colors. This is a logo, this is a branding, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, we just finished rebranding, here's our logo, here's our style guide, can you use these colors? It's a question I also tend to ask just because I think more alignment is better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Does that make thanks. sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then moving on to um, the, the second uh, circle was around templates, using pre-designed templates. So here's an example of a template that I designed. So this was for a school uh, here in San Francisco who just got a new head of school. So they had a large faculty and trustee meeting. There are about 80 people there. And they wanted, and they had just um, the board had just approved their new mission statement, which you see at the top, it's Drew School in San Francisco. And their mission is, Drew knows and believes in teenagers. We engage each student in a process of intellectual discovery to develop an individual voice, the confidence to express it, and the empathy to understand its impact. So that's their mission. And then what uh, the leadership team wanted is they wanted um, both participants at the meeting to identify the qualities and the skills that would sort of, that would uh, be the quality of, and skills of an ideal future graduate using the mission statement to guide them. Mm. So when they received this, um, it had the picture of the graduate in the middle, the hillside, but the rest of it was all blank, right? So groups got together and they developed um, these various areas. And I did not say... Um, in this example, oh, you know, use these dotted line, blue dotted line areas to create categories, but some of the groups did that. They just felt it was useful to do it that way. So what happens is you give, you know, perhaps 10 of these out to a group, they all fill them out, and then they come back to share the information. You get information that is normalized and visually uh, similar, so it's easily, easier for people to, to track the information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is an example, again, of a template. Um, this was a meeting that I did for uh, uh, SFUSD here in San Francisco. This is their educational placement center. So the school district here um, has, as every district does, a large office where families come to do placement for their, for their children for entering school. So they had a retreat uh, that I did, and you can see how on this one page, again, this is a template that is initially blank, and then I filled in some of this, and we also did some of this as a group. So I came in with the outcomes on the right-hand side, 
you know, that are, um, that were already filled in that I had determined with the leadership team. And then we had, we had worked out some of the agenda pieces, but not all of them. So we left it up to the group to decide how they wanted to arrange their day. We had components and things that kind of had to get done, but then there was also some choices that we could make. So it's a little hard to see on this copy because I've cleaned it up digitally, but a lot of these, um, a lot of these pieces and the times are written on sticky notes. So we generated this in real time. So based on the outcomes, how are we going to get there? What's the agenda that will get us there? And then as a group, we talked about roles and responsibilities. So what are the behaviors that we wanted to see in this meeting? So here on, and this was a four by eight chart that hung in the space that was there all day that people could refer to throughout, throughout the day. So when this chart was, was first, you know, um, displayed, it had the outcomes and everything else, all those white spaces in the middle were pretty much blank except for the title. Okay. okay. Um, and then also just, you know, to note the, you know, you could do this lots of different ways um, with just kind of four boxes, but I think there's also for this team in particular, mm -hmm. a team that was grappling with a huge volume of work, um, you know, a big sort of gap in terms of the number, there were tons of veteran people, and then there were lots of people who were six months or less, you know, new to the organization and not lots of people in between. So that also created um, some like really interesting opportunities for them uh, as, a, uh, as a team. So using this metaphor of this group of people, everyone in EPC was in the same boat, right? All going to the same outcomes to the same destination um, and everyone needing to, to paddle in order to, to get there was something that they really responded to. So that idea of using a metaphor to galvanize people and to motivate people. Any questions about that? Yeah, so Giselle, just to, um, and maybe, you know, we can talk about this, you know, to hear the needs, but that um, piece, I just want to emphasize what I'm hearing you say is the template has those kind of placeholder areas and then mm -hmm. folks could actually use that for their meetings, right, and fill it in either ahead of time or with their group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you. And here's one that actually, I wanted to show you one that before it was filled in, just so you can see um, mm -hmm. what it looks like. So this is a, a meeting I did for a foundation who uh, was doing a convening around building a culture of philanthropy within their organization. So what they were seeing is that the uh, kind of the, um, the job of, of fundraising was falling on a single person within the organization and how can you share that uh, that role or that sense that it is in some ways everyone's job to be thinking about uh, development throughout the organization. So we created these empathy maps, which some of you may have seen before, where people were asked to assume the role or the perspective of these various people. So this one is for a board member, we also had one that looked very similar with a different illustration in the middle for a program director. We had another one for a client. So the idea is, you know, what would, imagine that you're in the shoes of this board member. What does this board member think? What does she say? What does she feel? What does she do? So groups, again, were asked to fill in these various areas, have a conversation, um, fill out this template. And then down at the bottom, their second task was, okay, so based on what you think this person thinks, says, feels, does, what organizational systems, processes, and tools would reinforce the culture of philanthropy, right, based on this person. So here's one that has not been um, filled in yet, but this was a similar breakout group situation. So groups worked for maybe an hour on these. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, Here's another one, moving away from, um, I guess this actually is still a template when I think about it. Um, this is uh, a process I did for uh, Hillbrook School, which is down in Los Gatos here in California, who had um, just finished developing their 2020 strategic plan. So 
they had these four different strategic plan areas or, you know, SP area that you see at the top. Um, one of them was reimagine the student experience. That was the big strategic plan, sort of big uh, sort of pillar or area of work for them. So then their task was as a leadership team, what are the actions that they would need to develop over three years to move them toward reimagining the student experience. So this was a administrative retreat of about eight people. And we spent some time developing on the side. You see those sticky notes that are on the side that have those lines at the top and the bottom, mm -hmm. that, you know, adopt new schedules, design and build the hub, continue to improve student assessment, et cetera. So all those running down the side um, are their goals. And then they developed as a group on these sticky notes, how they would get there over three years. So this really breaks down. So they didn't have to think of the steps and sequence them. They could think of the steps first and then sequence them based on who was going to do what. So the step after this was they actually went through and decided who was going to take um, ownership of what piece. So hmm. this is a three waves, you know, three year, three waves, planning tool. Again, it's a template because when I first gave it to them, it had the three blank waves and nothing. And then they populated it with the sticky notes in small groups. What we've actually done is I've continued to work with this group. And what I do every year is I actually physically bring the same chart. and We just keep moving the sticky notes down or, and it gives them an opportunity to check in and say, okay, so we thought we were going to, you know, um, we are going to do more work around the service learning program, but we realize now that designing and building the hub needs to take priority. So we need to move these over here, move these up. So it also gives them some flexibility and a, a checkpoint every year. So it's not like we designed the three years and we're done, but it also creates an iterative experience for the group as well. And it's also nice because the routine of it, now that they've been through it twice, I bring out the chart and they're like, oh yeah, the chart. Like they, they know it and because they experienced it graphically and in, in this large scale way. And because they created it, they know it really well. So they know the content as, as well. So this has been a really nice tool. It looks a bit like a logic model in some ways, but with mm -hmm. a lot less, you know, all of the other stuff. So I like the idea of the post-it notes on there that you can move around too. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Yep. All right, let me see what else I have. Let me, um, let's do this. Let me talk to you about um, this graphic. And I, what I've done here is um, I have this slide, which is the finished product, but I can also show you some, some images that will give you a sense of how we got to this, this piece. Because I thought perhaps this is um, just in talking with Sue and getting a sense of maybe what some of the needs are this might be something or a version of this that might be useful for some of you. So this is a graphic that I created for uh, student affairs at Stanford a couple of years ago, who uh, wanted to create, as you can see here, a graphic, a single page graphic that communicated their mission, their vision um, on a single page to both their external, ex externally to the university and the public and for themselves as an internal group. Because student affairs, as you probably know, is comprised of all kinds of different audience, offices, all different kinds of folks have a piece in student affairs. So how do you organize that? How do you get people on the same page? So they went through this um, larger process where they sort of determined um, what they wanted to say. So they worked on the text themselves, and then they brought me in closer to the end of the process to kind of finalize some of the ideas and then to think about how this might look in a graphic. So I did a, um, just a half day meeting with them. And this is the agenda. Um, I talked a bit about, you know, at the time, one of the, one of the things that you can call this, it's a story map. So how does it tell the story of your organization? So we talked about what a story map is, what it does. It create, you know, it uses some kind of visual metaphor. It um, tells the story of an organization. It shows people where they are in the organization, you know, kind of at, at uh, like what their piece of the work is. And then also what the larger vision of the organization is as well. And as I mentioned before, it's a communications tool that can be internal and external. 
So we did some work around um, thinking about who the audience might be, what the purpose of the story map would be, and then what's essential, what is the essential piece of information they want to convey. And then we did some work generating metaphors in small groups, visual metaphors. And then I have a quick conversation around themes, what they saw as the, the compelling qualities of the graphic they might make. And then I did some sketching with them as a whole group just to, to um, tease out their ideas a little bit more. So it's a pretty quick meeting, um, but we actually got a lot done. So this was, and I don't, don't expect for you to read all of this. I just want you to see the overview of what it looks like. So we spent some time thinking about, okay, so who is the audience for this graphic? You know, who are we doing this for? And they generated, you know, um, various stakeholders. You can see they got campus partners, students, committees, alumni, donors. Uh, what is the purpose of the story map? Some of the um, things they mentioned was to build belief in the program, to brand the program, to educate, um, for it to be fun, different, creative, to communicate the values student affairs and then what is the essence of what you want to tell so um, now here we start to move into a place where people are starting to think about metaphor a little bit so uh, some of the responses are it's a dynamic system um, we change and then we act and then we're acted upon it's evolving it's enduring um, making meaning of all the parts of the program it's rooted in core values there's an artistry and a science of what we do So those are the three main areas, audience, purpose, essence. And then from there, again, and this is an example again of a template. This is a really straightforward one I just did on a flip chart. So I handed out a bunch of these to groups of three or four. So I had them play with that idea of a metaphor. So it's, very, it's a very simple kind of fill in the blank sentence. So our vision for student affairs at Stanford is like a, like or like a blank because blank because blank and because blank. So they had to fill in that statement and then write additional phrases or make sketches. So this group, and I have some other examples, um, said our vision for student affairs at Stanford is like the, metaf the metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a butterfly because we challenge students to grow, because students take ownership of their evolution, because the process is hard and requires resilience, right? So you can see the drew the, you know, the tree branch with the cocoon and the butterfly. This group, oh, they did another one. So they did, um, our vision for student affairs at Stanford is like a coast redwood because it's a structurally complex organism, because it supports sizable communities made up of individuals, because it is diverse, ever changing and impacts the environment around it, right? So you can see how the use of metaphor helps push their thinking. Um, at a sort of larger systems level, um, as opposed to, you know, um, sort of like we deliver a program, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then let's see, um, I think I included, oh yeah, so here's another one. They, they kind of went crazy, so they did many more than I had templates prepared for, but this, was, this one was a little bit different. Our vision for student affairs is like a kaleidoscope because it's continuously evolving because there's fundamental, uh, there's fundamental structure and complexity because it's responsive to the user and because it can be shared, right? Mm. So the idea is even if they don't, uh, if we don't settle on one of these ideas for the final graphic, we can start to mix and match and sort of mash together ideas to create something that will, that will work and really resonate for the group. Mm -hmm. This is another one about a tree, Stanford trees make sense. Um, their vision is like a tree because it's fundamentally rooted, because it grows, it changes with the seasons, it provides structure and shelter, it has many branches. So after we did this exercise, they presented them, and then we had a pretty straightforward conversation. What do we notice about all of the metaphors? And these were the themes and patterns they pulled out. So um, a lot of the metaphors were organic in nature, uh, it dealt with growth and evolution. There was an interdependence there. There were dynamic systems, strength, sense of strength, etc. Okay. 
I think, Giselle, I just want to add, um, you know, that's something we have in our playbook and have encouraged sites is just the use of metaphors. Mm -hmm. And I know a couple of the sites have actually tried that with um, <laughs> drawing out like a floor to ceiling um, tree mm -hmm. on, um, you know, different flip part chart paper that they have actually pasted together and used that um, in meetings to be able to Kind of have the group think where do they fit in the tree like where's the ACH where's the partner so, yeah. so I think the metaphors are very powerful particularly when you're all trying to make sense of this yeah I think in addition to that the other way I've seen metaphors be very useful well, sometimes you know sometimes people balk a bit at the use of metaphor because you know the responses I've gotten in some in some places where I've used this is people will say, well, we're not talking about streams. We're talking about, you know, this, you know, this hardware architecture system or whatever it happens to be. But I think one of the additional benefits of using metaphor is it helps people think about um, sort of laterally around about areas that they may not be focused on because they're focused on solving a problem. So if you, if you put a metaphor overlay over that and you say, okay, so if we are a tree, what are the roots that feed us? You know, where we've got these main branches, but we also have these leaves, you know, like what season are we in right now? It helps people think more expansively mm -hmm. um, about other areas. Okay. So, in this particular meeting, after we did that, what you see here is I basically took some time to sketch out in real time with the group um, what some of these metaphors might look like if we started to visualize them. So you can <laughs> use of post-its and uh, very simple sketching. We worked on the Coast Redwood idea. The kaleidoscope is in the middle and also the right. That was a tricky one, but it was pretty interesting. And then uh, the other idea they had was a river. So moving from a spring, uh, moving into river rapids down to the ocean was another metaphor they liked. So here are some details of those sketches. So you can see here that um, some people in this group said, oh, let's just, you know, let's just do a tree. Some said, no, let's create the larger ecosystem that shows what ecosystem supports the tree. So we talked about why that might be useful for student affairs, why not? And then the use of post-its to, to label the various areas. So, okay, the core values are, you know, at the base of the roots, the interconnection might be in the ecosystem, you know, the interplay between, you know, the stream and then the tree and the weather and the animals. This is the spring to ocean metaphor. So people liked this one because we could, it featured uh, little vignettes of people, you know, engaged in various activities around student affairs in this space. And then this was the kaleidoscope, which we ultimately did not go to. As you saw, we went with the, the tree, but this was interesting in that it, it because so many of them were nature-based, just to work with a different kind of metaphor, I think even though we didn't go with this one, it ultimately informed some of the work that showed up in the final one. So the idea that um, there are various lenses, that it's uh, user-friendly, that everyone who looks through the kaleidoscope sees something different, um, it's adaptive, right, um, was an interesting idea. And here we tried another version of what it would look like graphically. So this one is um, more like seeing the overlapping lenses. I think they were thinking about their various um, offices or services as one lens. And then, you know, you combine different lenses to have a student experience. This one's slightly different um, where we tried to, to have a different perspective of um, you know, someone looking out, are you looking, is someone viewing through the kaleidoscope or is someone, is someone like seeing it projected somewhere? So it became a little bit too unwieldy, but it was an interesting idea to work with for a while. So then from there after, so this was in the meeting and then after I went away, I took the information and I developed these sketches of the top ideas that people felt most compelled by. So this was the, um, this was the river, this was the spring, 
um, to uh, ocean. So I actually, once I got home and started thinking about it, I started thinking about um, water cycles, you know? So you can see up on the mountain, there's rain that's trickling down that moves into these pools and then eventually moves out to the ocean. And, and there was something compelling about this idea of um, students graduating and then moving out and sort of sailing away, you know, from, from the landscape. So this is one idea. And then all the text here is text that they, that they mostly had already from a separate strategic planning process. So I, so, um, I, I identified with them what categories that they what did they want to include um, and help them make the, some decisions there and put it, put it in the, the document. Part of the reason I wrote it all in is because um, they were really attached to this language because they'd spent a lot of time on it and they'd done it um, kind of in this, uh, not by committee of exactly, but they'd done it as a group. So there was a lot of investment in this language. And I think they were very, very, um, mm -hmm. uh, they were reticent to give any of it up. But I think part of the reason I wrote it all in is I wanted them to see that it was just simply too much text um, for what they wanted to convey. So this is the tree of the Coast Redwood. And we had this idea uh, to put in the campus building behind it. So you can see, um, you know, if you've been to Stanford, you can see the tower there building their vision for student affairs, their vision is up in the top right. And then um, we started talking about their work in terms of these very simple questions, which is who we are, how we work, and what will we do next? So you can see that in banners around the tree. And then the what we do is down in the bottom left on the ground. So create opportunities for students, promote diversity, empower students, support individuals, provide resources, et cetera. So this is the same text that's here. It's just arranged differently with a different metaphor. This is the kaleidoscope, which we ultimately didn't go with. But again, you can just see um, how that information was conveyed using this this idea of the, the changing kaleidoscope. And then this is, uh, you know, this was related to this one, the tree, but this is a simpler version. And again, put in all the texts so they could see that it was just way too much and they ultimately did um, cut it down. But I think the, the other piece of work that we accomplished here is we figured out um, where the various categories would go. So they decided here that the mission would be on the top, top left, and then uh, top right for the vision. What will we do next is at the top of the tree, who we are, how we work is at the bottom, and then the what we do is, is down near the roots. Hmm. I think actually, if we look at the final, this is almost final, this is the final, um, you see it's much more pared down in the final version. There's a lot of white space. Um, they've really came to a place where they've decided what was essential and they decided to put the mission down at the bottom because the mission they saw is actually really foundational in their roots. Mm -hmm. The vision, what they're reaching for is at the top and then the who we are, how we work and what we do are at different places within, within the tree. And what we do is more on the ground because then you could actually um, have like the, what we do is the operational like op how do you operationalize the, the who you are and how we work, right? So that's where you include the various kinds of programs for student mm -hmm. affairs. That's nice that it's all on one document, like mm -hmm. one, yeah. When we started, when I had my first meeting with these folks, they had a 20 page text oh. document, you know? Um, and that was the, the task is how do you make this into a one page graphic? That, that can serve all these various needs, can convey the work that they do, and then also honors the process, right, that they had already gone through to get to this place. Okay. So I think that is all for me for um, the case studies and the sample. I'm going to, in a minute, um, I will ask you all to think a bit about 
how this methodology might be helpful in your own organization or ways you could imagine using some or, or part um, of this methodology. But before that, I wanted to um, just give folks a chance to ask questions if you wanted to go back and look at anything, um, any questions you have about not only about what I've shown here, but also just about kind of what it looks like, what it feels like in the room, anything else for you. Yes, yeah, so do you guys have any questions at all just regarding what you've seen or any reflections, responses? And feel free to either put it in the chat or just speak out. So it looks like, this is Sue Kincaid, it looks like you're pretty flexible and you can kind of start at different um, stages of planning processes um, or you can take existing information and add to it. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And sometimes I, and sometimes we have created, um, created things from the, the beginning, you know, but there's always something that's pre-existing within the organization, you know, so here's our, and, and sometimes it's also a way to articulate the complexity of lots of different arms of a program or arms of an organization, right? So we have, for instance, if an organization has, you know, programs, partnerships, grant making, you know, how do you, how do you, and more, right? How do you articulate that in a way um, that conveys all of that information in a simple, elegant way. Um, so, so I would say that, that it is definitely at any part of the process. Sometimes some of the work is done. Sometimes it's all done. Sometimes that's, that's part of what I do also. And often because I'm not in the organization, a lot of it is just asking what I hope are compelling questions, right? So, okay. So it looks like you have this strategic plan. How does that align with these program goals? How does that work with your, you know, with um, directors, you know, professional goals for the year or how they're, how they're providing leadership for their folks, right? So a lot of it is asking those kinds of questions as well. Okay. And I'm thinking of like a, um, a mini retreat that we're talking about doing this summer where we have established our goals for the coming um, grant year um, with our, grant, our funder from July 1st on, but we want to kind of dig deeper and like what, what is, what kind of specific steps and, you know, what do we agree on, you know, what's the mm -hmm. wellness fund going to look like and mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. just trying to imagine something like this in that situation. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Where we're trying to get agreement, you know, where somebody, you know, we all have certain thoughts in our heads as we put the words down on paper, but when we sit down and really talk about it, different ideas come out and then, mm -hmm. we think, oh, okay, this is what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some of that is, um, I would say, kind of great you know, best facilitation practices around coming up with ways for people to come to consensus in a way that makes sense. And I also think that there are things that can be done graphically in group processes that make the, um, that make, that make groups converge pretty efficiently. And then afterward, when people leave, <laughs> you can bring them back around the graphic, right? And say, because people leave and then they do their daily work and things happen. But then the next time you meet, you can say, okay, remember we were at this retreat. Here's the graphic we produced. Here's that area where we really came to consensus around these five things that we want to do, or these five agreements or principles or whatever they are. And it's part of that um, record that was created as, as a group, you know? Right. How many people want to go back to an Excel spreadsheet and look at their, yes. <laughs> their <laughs> unless it pertains to them personally? Uh. I, you know, I think it's, it's also interesting you mentioned that because um, sometimes I've been asked by people that I've worked with to take what I've done and type it out, you know, afterwards. And I've always pushed against that because part of the power of doing it graphically is you look at it and you instantly remember. Like people instantly remember where they were, who they talked to. Maybe someone told a funny anecdote and I've drawn a little picture of part of that anecdote and it creates a very sticky, enduring memory. 
to look back at the, the charts that were created. Yeah, and I was sharing with Sue Grinnell um, that I was at a conference recently and um, I was trying to process everything and it was really helpful to kind of draw it out and kind of apply it to our um, collective impact FTIP, you know, and mm -hmm. kind of where do, what do we look like based on what I'm hearing and so on. And that was kind of fun to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's also a way of testing, of, of figuring out how it's a work tool, right? So I think sometimes, um, and I, and I also, something else I try to caution people against is the finished product is engaging and, you know, well done and, and, you know, highly presentable. Mm -hmm. And at the heart of it, it's a communications tool and a work tool, you know, mm -hmm. so I hope that that also like that is also part of the process is that people can use visual tools to to uh, think differently about whatever problem they're trying to solve. You know? mm -hmm. no, that's great. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yes, yeah, Sue actually was drawing when she was in Atlanta and she sent me a picture. <laughs> <laughs> it was very rough. <laughs> Yeah. No, but it's good. I mean, a lot of people do doodle or try to make sense of things. I think particularly because you guys are all trying to figure out your structures. That's, that's a big one, I think, where how does this fit with this and how does that, because everybody has an idea of sometimes like who's on top, who's, who tells who what to do what, right? All of those things. So I think, you know, my experience has been with, um, this tool, right, this process, it, it helps to get clarity around those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Can people see well, me I right think now? you can. Go ahead. Are you able to see me drawing right now? No. Oh, really? Okay. Oh. Really? Okay. Let me see you guys. I've been, as we talked, I started to do this. Let me see. Well, I even thought about it um, in, in a, my personal life. Like I keep thinking, okay, I need to do a timeline of our family, you know, and the mm. kids and things like that. So then I had this idea to take those big sheets and put them down the hallway and just start from the beginning and just keep adding to it for the for our kids and have mm. them add their stuff too. Oh, fun. Right. Yeah. Right. It's true. Um, I've planned family vacations, three generation <laughs> family vacations using this. <laughs> That's great. Yep. All right. Can you see what I'm doing now? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's very cool. Anything else? Potential uses and or questions? Patty, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I am really impressed by Giselle's artistic skills. <laughs> um, and what I'm thinking of is, you know, wow, this is, is really great. I think it would be really useful for our uh, work. But then I think I'm not a good artist. <laughs> so I think what are some tools to use when you lack that sort of, you know, artistic flair? So what I would say is, um, I think, and also, so I think part of the next steps for, for this group is to have me available for um, some potential coaching with individual sites to see what would make sense. Um, so that's one piece. And um, to the question about skills, I think the use of templates is actually a really, really um, great scaffolding um, a way to sort of scaffold the process. So it's not, you know, if you recall those first images I showed you, that was graphic recording, like put up a big piece of paper, it's blank, stand there, wait and start drawing, right? So I don't think there's the expectation that that would be the way to go in a group process, right? But perhaps if, you know, I could work with individual sites and there's a, a meeting you have or a convening or a process that you're gonna do, um, repeatedly where I might design a template for you right and then you have that and then that's something that could be put up on a wall that you could fill in you know so it's something that that um, would be facilitated internally but you would have this graphic aid that would be provided to help organize that that 
session or that part of the session. Mm. Hi, this is Laurie in Lake County. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. <clears throat> so Giselle, the whole Stanford um, group of boards that you had and coming to, you know, the final tree graphic, yeah. like how many meetings and what kind of time investment was that on your part and their part to get from, you know, initial concept to final rendering? Yeah, so that, that first, I had a hour meeting with the leadership team to okay. talk to me about what they've done and to show me the document. We had a three hour meeting with a larger group of folks. So the, uh, that they wanted, they wanted their input in the graphics. So that was a group of maybe 16 folks. And that was a three hour meeting. And okay. then there, there were two or three people primarily that were, were charged with <laughs> working with me around giving me feedback around what I created. So I would create the sketches, I would email them to these three folks. They would convene, come up with feedback, give it back to me. Some of it we did over email, some of it we did over the phone. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then, and we also wrote in, um, I think we did three, two versions of sketches and then two versions before getting to the final graphic. And that's all something. Okay be scoped ahead of time because sometimes people have you know this group had maybe four months you know they had a lot I, to me it's significant amount of time to devote right um but if people don't have that time we can also shorten you know the the timeline and that's primarily done by the number of iterative design rounds that we do okay mm -hmm. And then just to tag on to that, Lori and others, you know, when I've used Giselle, like it's been either all day or, you know, we actually did work in uh, Fresno Sioux and Monterey and it was, I don't know, how long were the meetings? They were not long. I mean, no more than four hours, like two to three hours. Um, so, you know, that's another, you know, just in terms of the process, right? So also on the graphic recording, when you're just coming in with that blank page and you're kind of going through that uh, keynote presentation or whatever it might be, um, at the end of that presentation, is that finalized or you take that with you and then kind of clean it up and, um, you know, do some extra flourish on it and then send it back? So that really depends on what, what is needed from the client. So very often what I do is I finish them on site and they're, they're done. You know, there isn't any more work that needs to, to be done because the, the, the intention is that they're a capture of what was, of the work that was contained within that time period I was there. Okay. If, if however, if the if <laughs> folks want to use it as an external communications tool, I often don't advise that they use the graphic recordings the way that I, sh the ones that I showed you for an external tool. Cause those are really created for the benefit of the people in that room, you know, who were there. Um, if there's a need to uh, have it be an external tool, I would probably advise looking at it again, sitting down with someone and saying, okay, so this is what happened. <laughs> what do you actually want to communicate from this meeting or from this talk, right? Maybe you don't want to include this portion where he talked about where he went to college for 15 minutes or what, you know what I mean? Maybe you want to focus mm. on, uh, you know, the impact. You don't even want to focus on the three, steps you want to focus on the impact stories he shared right so so that could be a built-in you know an, an opportunity that can be built in right if it wants if there is um a desire to share it externally okay so you're doing the graphic recording right there finish it and then maybe follow-up meetings to create almost an additional graphic for them to use externally yeah yeah. Okay. One or, yeah. Or instead of okay. using that one externally. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks.
And you know, Lori, when you're saying that, I, uh, Giselle, you use the example, I think what I heard you say is almost like icons, right? Like, I think that's really powerful, like maybe from a branding perspective too, because as you're developing different work groups, right? If you think about, you know, here's all of this, so here's communication or here's finance and begin to kind of come up with an icon for that. Like I know, Laura, you guys are just starting to do a newsletter. Um, you know, having, um, I think what I heard you say, Giselle, like that's also possible just in terms of like creating that for um, an external audience. Yeah. I mean, what I would say to that is the graphics that I create tend to be part of a group process or like mm-hmm. the outcome of a group process. I'm not a trained graphic designer mm-hmm. <laughs> that's something mm-hmm. else yeah i don't want to i wouldn't want to um to sort of represent my my what i sure. do as something it's not so it's really not graphic design although there is a lot of overlap i think it really is a an outcropping or a a product that comes from a group process that involves visuals you know mm-hmm. yeah i wouldn't really trust myself to do a, <laughs> a graphic designing yeah <laughs> <laughs> what are you designing in right now that we're watching you draw? This is Sketchbook Pro. Okay. And I chose this because it's pretty, um, you know, it's also, the t- there are many tools. This is also one that I chose because I knew I'd be at home. I could work on this giant screen. This doesn't have that many palettes. So you can kind of see what I'm doing. Some of them are a little bit, you can see like a lot of the tools on the side. So I want to choose something mm-hmm. straightforward. Sketchbook Pro. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Lori's going to go buy it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say I probably will. <laughs> I, 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 Don't I, be embarrassed. <laughs> no. also, I, I also primarily, I work, I do a lot of work on the, on my iPad, my iPad Pro. So I don't know if you have one or have access, but the iPad Pro and the Apple Pencil, there are mm-hmm. lots of really good apps and uh, yeah. And if you want to follow up with me after the call, I'm happy to talk to you more about tools and tools. Great, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions or? So Giselle, like, so just to, um, with following up with the sites that are interested, um, I don't know if you want to talk any more about that, you know, just kind of, cause I see you've got, you know, this capability. So, you know, and I think most of them all have video, um, you know, capacity, which is important for this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's definitely, so are you asking how or if we- Yeah, just if you want to speak to, just for the, for those that are on, like, you know, how Mm -hmm. next steps and, you know, because I think some of them have been thinking about this and might, um, you know, find it useful, right, in some way. Yeah, so um, here, I mean, and let me know, Sue, if this doesn't make sense or if I'm skipping a step, but Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things we talked about was, you know, if, folks are, are, are interested and just and want to talk through what some of the options might be, I'm happy to do that and you can contact me and we can set up a time to connect and, and uh, I, I kind of see that as sort of me, you know, uh, working individually with each site about what might make sense since I think doing kind of a one size fits all, you know, approach is not going to work. Um, because everyone's at different places. So I think that would be a good first step is to see is to connect, see what the options are, and then go from there. Because they can really, I mean, it really, as you saw from the, um, hopefully from the samples I provided, it really is, you know, kind of in-person graphics potentially to uh, a communications graphic that tells the story of your organization to templates that help you with uh, a process, you know, to anything else. And even, you know, in speaking with Lori, 
you know, I do, I do coach and train people in this methodology as well. So if someone's like, oh my gosh, I want to learn how to do that. I run lots of meetings. <laughs> I would love to have just like five mm-hmm. things I can go to under my belt. That's also something that's possible too. Mm-hmm. Nice. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and you know, maybe the group could, you know, the folks that are on, I'm just wondering also about templates. Yeah. Um, you know, if, um, you know, if there might be a set of those you know, like that we could, you know, provide, cause I think, you know, those are really helpful in these yeah. processes, right. To have as a, as you use the term go to, and I don't know if for those of you that are on the phone or on the, on the call, if having those might be helpful, um, to try out, um, any thoughts from you all or. This is Sue. Yeah, I think that would be very, very helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Sue, this is Patty. I, I also think that having templates would be really, really helpful. We have a partnerships and communication work group um, that launched a couple months ago. So I think it comes at a really good time and this is something that we could bring to them um, as a way to also engage our partners in the process of creating these visual tools. So I Great. think you really helpful. Yeah. Okay. Yay. Good. Okay. Great. All right. Well, this is awesome to watch you uh, draw, <laughs> drawing. Oh, well, good. Yeah, no, it's just good to see. Sketch yeah. Pro. Yeah. Yeah, Sketchbook Pro. I hope, yeah, and I think, you know, Sue, so when we were developing the agenda for this call, I think that's also what was one of, you know, the hopes we had is that, you know, we could give people an overview of the methodology with goals and samples, and then just a very brief kind of way to see it in action on a call. So mm-hmm. People can see, you know, what it looks like in real time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. Okay, anything else? Any other questions or... Um... So I think, um, and then Giselle, I'll follow up with you just in terms of, you know, um, you know, maybe what I'll do is send out a note to the group and ask them. I mean, we can do it either way. I know there's folks on here, it sounds like they're going to reach out, but just to make sure for people that are interested, they can follow up. Yep. So, yeah. Absolutely. Great. great. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all. This was great. All right. Yet another tool in your toolbox. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is an exciting one. Thank you, Sue, for putting it all together. Sure, sure. I'm glad to hear that. Great. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Have a great well, day.